thinking is an art form and it, when you have specific techniques to use it and to make uh, always nice to like, use it and then break it also you know and then play with it <laughs> Stephanie Palomino is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Stephanie is one of Europe's leading female mobile pioneers. She co-founded her first company, the mobile social network Aka Aki. I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right, in 2006. It went on to be named the best mobile social network in the 13th annual Webby Awards. In 2015, she co-founded Red Lab, a boutique consultancy based between Berlin and Munich and Barcelona, which supports clients in their interactive smart digital events and communications. Stephanie's work has been covered by media outlets like CNN, The Times, TechCrunch, and France too. On the side, a special note, she teaches Tai Chi when she's in India at the ashram. And you can see the nice Tai Chi signed and, and writings behind her. So um, it's, a, it's a positive background for those of you who are watching the video, that is. Stephanie, welcome to the podcast. It's so good that you're here. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. Thank you. I'm You're most welcome. <laughs> I'm excited too. And you know, just for our listeners, our paths have crossed and we've kind of known each other one way or the other for, for quite some time, not only MLove, but Future IO and Internet and many other probably paths have crossed over the years for different events that we do. And I'm glad that we can kind of have the time now um, in a podcast form to have a deep dive and have a discussion. Um, you've been doing this work on for quite some time, and uh, I want to know, were you prepared for all this craziness that we just are still going through, I guess? Did it help you, or were you prepared for the humans of new work? Were you prepared for the digital transition, and how are you? How have you been? How have you weathered this crazy time? I mean, I, um, for myself, uh, I was very lucky because um, I'm, a, I'm an introvert and my, um, yeah, my business is mostly basically also making workshops, a lot of workshops, interact with a lot of people and traveling a lot. And through, um, yeah, those Corona times, I figured I don't like to travel and I don't like to see so many people. <laughs> and for me, it was really yeah, perfect, actually, uh, to, to have a lot of exchange with people, but having this digital layer in between. So this gives me as an introvert, a lot of security. And just like, you know, I can flip it off, and then it's gone, you know, everyone is gone. And this is extremely good for me. So I, um, yeah, detoxed a lot, I started making intensively sport, I lost a lot of weight, um, I could move with my husband to Barcelona for quite some time. And we actually are in total quarantine since March last year. So we really said, okay, let's just really um, decide for ourselves. We want to have maximum of security. And um, so, yeah, so we said, okay, um, first lockdown we did alone. And then we said, okay, maybe we have the chance to take care of his parents here in Spain because it was for them a bit hard, you know? And so we said, okay, let's pack our stuff. We took a car drove the whole way through to Barcelona and now we're here in Malgrette Mar. It's a, it's a little beach town here at the coast in the Costa Brava. And um, yeah, it's a dream come true. I'm, I was jogging in the morning at the water and um, I'm looking now out of the window when I talk to you and see the trees from a park. And in Berlin, I only see concrete. Yeah, so yeah. I'm... A, I'm perfectly good here. And um, for me, it was the transition really smoothly. And I try to give this positive vibe also to um, everyone in our team. And I think that's it's more the human spirit. It's not used to this. We are having so many desires and helping them to yeah, go through this time, be shared up and be grateful for this opportunity to look more inwards. This was more the, the main task on hand. 
Well, I think you've done very well and, and congratulations on that move. It probably couldn't pick a more beautiful place to, to do it in a better time. So, uh, so the, the, the lockdown vacation almost, so to say, but it sounds like it's been a nice time. Yeah, it is a very nice time. And I mean, of course, we had all our challenges. And um, but I really love to see how much we can do digital. And um, so we transitioned basically the whole business into digital workshops and digital events. And we found amazing formats that we can co-create, collaborate with others. And it's really a lot of fun. I mean, of course, it's for people first step very, very exhausting, you know. And uh, they miss the human interaction a lot. They miss the physical, the physical interaction. But with the time when they get used to it, the human spirit is so easy to adapt, right? And now after a year, people really see, ah, okay, wow, I can save so much time traveling. Wow, I can do something for the environment. You know, all this like, um, like flights around the world. Um, and man, that's also awesome for uh, opportunity for companies, you know, to really say, hey, let's use this opportunity to also like get a bit more efficient and look what's really what matters most. And I mean, it's a challenge for like, especially extroverts, especially networking people who lift actually up through the energy of others. And for them, it's especially hard and it's really important to keep also the empathy up for this kind of people, yeah. I totally agree. There, there's a couple other things like you're one of the top 50 German creatives, uh, um, uh, according to Business Punk magazine. You um, did the, you're an author of the Lean Back Perspective. Um, you just came out with a fabulous game uh, as the art director of a Logic iOS game, the Queen Rule game, rules game, um, and I must tell you, so I. I, I normally don't play games because I have an addictive personality and um, I got the game because I knew we would be speaking and I wanted to support you, but I also wanted to take a look into it. And I'm kind of mad at you because you've just tapped into all my addictive personality and I finished it. I had to finish all the levels, which it probably is meant to be done over weeks, months, and just at, at your leisure but I just don't have that personality, but you, you do so many beautiful, wonder things, wonderful things. And then I, I guess one, one last thing is, I guess that's fitting for your introvert per personality is you do this uh, Socrates, Socrates dialogues or Socratic dialogues every Thursday at three o'clock on uh, Clubhouse, which I think is probably good digital layer for introverts to kind of they can be quiet if they want to or they can have a view but it's also gives you this nice distance um so i i see a lot of things could you tell me about two things the lean back perspective and also the launch of the game kind of how is that going how did that develop is that another project that came through red lab or is that something that you guys came up with yourself Wow. Okay. So let's start with the book. Then let's go to the game and then talk about the dialogue in the end. Okay. So Perfect. I think it work. Um, so um, years ago, after um, like a very interesting year of a lot of work, um, my husband and I, we decided, hey, let's take a time off. So we were like, I don't know if you ever had that moment when you in April know in November, you will be totally screwed, you know, and you will know, okay, so much things to do. And November, you have to do something in November will be good for you. And we had that moment. And in this uh, second, we, um, yeah, decided to do some meditation classes together. I mean, this was, I think, 2011 or 12 or something like this, and ish or 13, something around that. And um, we had a nice teacher and he recommended us an ashram in, in India and um, he said this would be the best place for meditation also learn, learning yoga and for you guys you travel a lot it's great to have a 30 minutes practice go to um, India and um, my husband and I we like really to do things 100% so we said okay we go to India let's do two months we take all the classes and we can do yoga on our own. We travel around the world making yoga sessions here and there for ourselves. 
then we forgot i forgot it actually and, and, and i think around october i was pretty worked out you know i was like wow worked up i was like oh my god i need a break i need a spa you know i was like where is a four star five star hotel where i can just check in it's, it's over and then my husband reminded me no no we booked a, like a room in this ashram and um could you not remember they even said maybe you have to uh, sleep on the floor and um, a lot of two things are not allowed and it will be not so comfortable at all and I was I was crying actually and so we were in the in the ashram for two months and there I met my Tai Chi teacher I figured I don't like yoga I'm a Tai Chi person <laughs> and um, there we uh, met a very wonderful lady called Aman that's a, a guru in, uh, in an ashram in India and um, she um, is a wonderful leader and stands for leadership with compassion. There's a beautiful book actually also, The Colors of the Rainbow, Leadership with Compassion from one of her swamis. And he wrote actually this book where she's basically the case study. And he, he was beautiful intro also where he was like real referencing to the big leaders in this world and what he learned in uh, business books he was reading also in the research phase he's anyway a very funny character and um, I was reading this book and then also the book of Sheryl Sandberg lean in in the ashram and that was getting a little bit angry about I was thinking wow this is exactly the this is zero compassion it's really about wow women should like lean in more like and I really failed a lot of my life because I leaned in too much. I'm totally in it, you know, living for it, dying for it, and then falling apart, basically. And um, then also with the practice of Tai Chi, I, I wondered, is not this lean in, lean out the perfect balance? You need to lean back to develop the strategy and you lean, need to lean in actually to execute. But the balance and the movement between those both things, this can create really a perfect balance in business. And that was basically the birth moment of the idea of the book. And we interviewed 42 uh, people for participation here because we didn't want to have a single view. That was also something uh, I didn't appreciate so much on lean, uh, lean in, it was just this single view on the world and we said okay how we can get a diversity how we can um, see this and uh, when it's female leadership i want to have freelance and i want to have women in high positions coaches artists and we had also one person was um, transitioning from actually a female to male uh, during the writing of the book actually that was also very very cool and yeah, so we had, um, and, and actually what was in the end resonated with all of us was really this like uh, synchronizing with your inner self. So when you basically allow yourself to be that person and don't be the person others are expecting from you, you can have this lean back perspective, what can bring you to this, yeah, moment of strength for yourself. So that's the well book. I definitely want to get a copy and I, I'm sorry I didn't know about it I didn't see you carrying it around or at any event so but I want you to sign a copy for me so I need to get it next time we see each other I'll either buy it and bring it and you signed it or or you bring one and I'll buy it off you um, that's yeah I'm, I'm very bad in promoting myself that's really bad uh, I never I thought tell. I was writing a book you know yeah. so it's like and when I was not writing it we were writing it all together and actually the inspiration was coming from the guru so it's like even more not my book you know at all but that's perfect that's uh, that re really sums up how you are as well you were you were then going to tell us about the the new game that you've got me addicted on but I'm I'm already detoxing myself from it so <laughs> Yeah, so um, the, the games are in my life since a long time. So um, in the Aka Aki times, actually, we started also a game project. And then Aka Aki was um, funded um, uh, um, very good. And we were creating a, actually a social network, a mobile social network location based. And there was this kind of gaming thing on Facebook was starting off. And we thought, OK, how we can create also a, a game layer over the world. And so the idea of um, the game's name was Lift Loft. Lift your loft. <laughs> you see, Aka Aki, Lift Loft, I, I kind of have a thing for stuff like that. And um, yeah. 
And it was really about collecting items, basically, and you could just grow your house with those items and you could play with people you have met nearby. And um, it was kind of a funny thing. And it was completely made out of paper, by the way. <laughs> and um, the idea, the basic idea of the gamification was coming from my husband. So I, um, in this times, hired him from the UK. Actually, I stole him from someone I know very well. He was head of mobile by Rumble. And uh, yeah. it was also location-based service. I don't know if you know Andrew Scott. Yeah, I do. Yeah, so I, I stole my husband from Andrew Scott. And, <laughs> and I hired him basically as my CTO. And so he had uh, this experience out of the game world. He was by Gameloft before and then by Rumble. And uh, since in mobile, since uh, I think 2009, he started developing the first thing with the first Nokias. And... Um, during the years, we were developing a couple of uh, game concepts. Uh, we also made another game called um, God. What is this? Was this one actually? It was. It's a. It's also a funny mosaic game. Now I don't tell you now. I don't want to make you addicted. Actually, it's kind of. Really <laughs> it's like Color Deluxe is the name. So it's an. It's another one and. Um, and this was now basically um, two years ago. Gabriel was coming up with this idea of numbers and stretching numbers. So the first name of the game was Stretchy Numbers. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. over two years, it's really modified his story. And we come up with this idea to have this like kind of queen. And the queen is uh, ruling. And um, it was also Gabriel's idea, it was not my idea. And I like this, he's a very feministic man. And um, so we have uh, in the game a queen and a king, but the king is always dragging along. You know, he always comes along, which is she's the leading character. And then we have the evil witch and um, yeah, they will phase off basically. Um, and it's always about uh, who makes the smarter moves basically. And um, it's, it has some genetically some, um, yeah, like ideas like, uh, like a chess game here and there because you have specific moves you can uh, do with specific um, characters. And um, yeah, it's just like try and error also. It's about reminding yourself what I have done already, which moves I have tried. But I think you better can describe it now after you played all the 158 levels. <laughs> Maybe I ask you, what, what is something you enjoyed uh, about the game? Oh, everything. I mean, just the visually stunning um, that it was, you know, what the characters were made out of um, clay. But what, what, is it, what is it called in German, the, the type of clay you use? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's Fimo, it's Fimo, Fimo. Is a brand, but it's, uh, it's um, I mean, I was growing up with Fimo. My mom was yeah. making st stuff out of yeah. Fimo when yeah. I was tiny. And um, and Larissa is the artist who produced all this, Larissa Honsik. And uh, she is amazing character designer. And I really literally researched the whole world. I was thinking, okay, Behance, come along. And I want to have the best character designer in a... I, I really loved what she is doing so much. And I love the texture, you know, between digital and, and physical and um, just this very unique style she it had. brought and both those worlds together. I just love it. I mean, it was so, and then there was the beautiful music, you know, kind of very soothing, but also engaging throughout and vi just visually stunning. So I'm a big chess fan. And so it's also has this very chessy type of a feel to it. Um, but I mean, it just, I, I could go on and on, but, and I don't want to be a spoiler because, uh, I, I think I do, others will get sucked in as well and want to get to the end, but there is an evil queen, but it's very big surprise at the end, what the evil queen does, because it's, uh, uh, very much, uh, it's real cool. You need to get to the end and, and, and check it out what she, what she does. So it's not all that evil. But uh, yeah. it's just a, it's a nice brain teaser. It's a nice way to kind of um, get into uh, as well, like stretching these numbers and, and, and kind of the puzzling in some respects. I thought also for kids, you know, it's nice to learn that basically numbers stays for, can stay for space, you know, because when you learn to stretch the numbers, you know, okay, it's just okay counting the moves, but it's also about how much space I'm occupying. And that can give you like kind of a physical touch to an abstract world of numbers. 
and um, I'm I love numbers. I'm since I'm a kid, I'm I'm always was fascinated, and I'm one of my first. I mean, when I was six, I really wanted a calculator so badly, and. <laughs> And when I thought, okay, it's a little bit like a device from a science fiction movie, this was the other thing, but I loved also buttons like crazy, I love to push buttons. So the calculator was like a dream come true, you could do all of it, you know, numbers, buttons, science fiction, <laughs> all of it. And uh, for, for me, I, I really thought with the game, um, it's nice that there is some emergence, you know, that numbers gives you this like emergence that there's something in themselves. You, you know, we, we made a lot of those levels by um, just with algorithms and then we played them and then we were categorizing them how difficult the game were, the level were, but also game, uh, Gable is able to make those levels. So that was impressing me the most about my husband that he was inventing some of the levels and the most difficult ones he did in his brain basically and I'm like whoa <laughs> yeah, that, yeah that's amazing it's so nice to hear that you guys did it together and it's something that you came up with and and developed uh, it, it definitely has that feeling it has a feeling of love a good team it has the feeling of something where a lot of thought went into it's not just something that someone came to you uh, to your agency and just said, hey, we'd like to do a game and, and this is how we do it. I know they would get that same love, but it just has a, a different feeling to it. And and it was really enjoyable. And that, I mean, even just, just the name and the visuals that I saw before I downloaded, I was like, I got, I got to try this, not just because we were going to have the podcast, but I just knew I, I, I've got to try it. And, and uh, um, and did it and so i i really thank you guys for that it was it was a good one it reminds me uh, or it not not necessarily reminds me but i think people who like sudoku would yeah. really like this uh people who like chess would really like it people who you know do other type of um connection games uh where, where they connect different areas together to to make a path work or to make something uh solvable I think they would like this because, it, like you said, it really involves the numbers, and and I'm also a numbers person. I I, I like that, and and it gives you it almost trains your brain to to view the world in in a different way as well, which it, which is nice. I really liked it a lot. So, uh, but enough about my addiction to that. Now, I, I really unless you have something else to tell me about that, I'd really like to hear about the. So Socratic dialogues on Clubhouse, and and I, I actually snuck by that a couple of times myself. So um, Socratic dialogues, man, that's uh, I mean, it's okay. Socrates, of course, I mean, he um, was helping a lot, looking um, philosophically at uh, specific questions or how people should like communicate. But um, the method methodology we use is actually from David Bohm. And um, he was writing a, a super nice a book about it. I have to look it up again. I'm always so bad with name dropping. Um, often I say it even in the dialogue and then, um, but I'm without notes, I'm always dying. So, but David Böhm is actually um, was a, a philosopher and also a quantum physician. And he was suffering mostly by the too much growing expertise into one field that people were starting having even their own language in specific fields. And it was more and more complicated that people were having yeah, good conversations about a topic. And this multidiscipl multidisciplinary approach that people over different disciplines are coming together, having a dialogue uh, over a topic, that's something he wanted to cultivate. And in Harvard, this is used uh, as a methodology quite often. Um, so I had a couple of people I encountered were in Harvard and they said, oh yeah, dialogue I had in Harvard, that's something we do there all the time. I said, oh, great. Good for you. Um, and for me, it's always, it's like about teaching people the art of listening. And so the art of thinking together by reaching really new perspectives. And through that, actually, a lot, much more creativity can, can come out. And we do a lot of design thinking uh, workshops and it's just this, um, I try to bring this to every workshop and say, hey guys, okay, it's great, the idea you just have that in this moment, but then give it a pause, just give it some room that other people can let something grow around it. 
And uh, this is not in our human nature. You know, we just like vomit then everything and like boom, boom, boom. And it's like, just give it like a break, some seconds. You know, and this is, this is something I really enjoy in moderating those dialogues by, um, yeah, using a very specific structure because, I mean, thinking is an art form. And it, when you have specific techniques to use it, and it's like, uh, always nice to yeah, use it and then break it also, you know, and then play with it. And so I'm in the moment with the dialogues on platform we are playing, you know, we are trying to see, okay, how we can stretch the format, what we can do differently. We frequently iterate on it, discuss afterwards, okay, what was working out, what could be better. And so it's an evolving methodology we try for the Clubhouse thing. And we have often very, very interesting um, listeners and participants. So yeah, it's, it's something I'm, it's really my hobby. I enjoy a lot and um, it makes me think, you know, it makes me think and um, makes me listen and wondering, you know. Can you tell me uh, a little bit more about your, your thoughts of how you feel about Clubhouse, where the future of Clubhouse is going? And there, there are some things right now, one, it's, <clears throat> It's really stuck to ISO iPhones or, or ISO de devices that are, I think it's 13.0 firmware above. So some older versions can't do it. It's not yet on Android or, or Google uh, availability to, to get onto it. But also there's no like a recorded uh, version of it. And it's, it's not that easy to, kind of share it with other social medias. There's a way to share the link on Twitter and other things, but it's kind of a screenshot type of a feeling that the way on one platform you're sharing it to get people onto Clubhouse. So it's like you can give them a screenshot of, of, of the room, but not really like an audio or something to, 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 to tell them what happened in the room or to kind of recap that. So I'd love to kind of get your ideas and your thoughts and feelings on that. And, and it, uh, who's it for? How's it evolving? And what, what kind of are your general thoughts around that? Man, man, I, man, I also in, co-invented 2006, The Social Network. And I'm so like really obsessed with this topic, you know? So um, when Clubhouse was coming out, I was really, like, really excited. And um, I think I was only so excited the same amount about actually, yeah, seeing MySpace the first time. And then actually Akaaki, when we built it, Akaaki was the same excited about this. And I was thinking, wow, this is kind of like really also my yeah favorite um, channel because it's really about the voice. You can focus about only the voice and I often get confused with the picture um, and, and I don't want to even see myself then I would love only to just focus on this voice and play with it and in Clubhouse you have this perfect limitation of this being in the moment and that also serendipity is going around so I'm like a like a room cruiser, you know, I'm like loving to just checking out what's happening just in this moment. I don't like to schedule. I'm uh, for for others uh, rooms. So only I have to take care of my own ones, but the rest I'm just hanging. I'm coming in, just checking out, participate or not. And I love this kind of serendipity is going on. And I mean, of course, for the, I mean, when you have done a social network in your life, you have, I think, a big heart for the people by Clubhouse because to launch a social network is a nightmare. It's just, um, especially when it gets traction with your servers, I, I'm really praying for those guys and that they can sleep here and there and um, that they limit it only to, to one um, uh, yeah, starting device in the beginning is amazingly clever, it's super important. Um, also one where they uh, feel that they could have like a first um, yeah, playground of the ideal users, mostly people most probably for the beginning, they also were known, it was easy for them to build traction. I have a hundred percent understanding of this and I can't understand people who say, oh, it's in the Android users. Well, yeah, it will all come one day, but just let them naturally grow and in the capacities they have, I mean, they got now tons of investment, but this can also be a trap sometimes. Now, a big getting, trap, yeah. 
yeah, organic growth is really important and they, they have to figure it out uh, step by step. And I would not yeah, put them more under pressure they have already, you know, it's, it's just what happen. And I think that um, they did a wonderful job by purposefully designing a space where um, a new unique um, experience is possible. And this is the reason I was so excited because I think, wow, nobody was coming up with this. This is this moment where you think, oh my God, why no one was coming up with this before? It's like so obvious and so clever, but it was not there. And I love this moment. I love that. I was like, wow. I would love to meet them and say, well, thank you so much. That's just a wonderful job. And don't start with recording stuff, hopefully. It's just, it's really fantastic, you know. They are um, giving people a space to talk and just don't have things there forever. We have a podcast for staying there forever, you know. It's not a competition yeah. podcast. It's just something yeah. totally different. It's, of course, for the target group, prefers listening so for the listening sound people i think they are yeah. more attracted to that but also I totally to agree. To instagrammers you know how many instagrammers on clubhouse i think they're happy that they finally have a voice you know give a voice to all those pictures then just forget the pictures for a while it's awesome I, I mean, it is awesome obviously we can tell that it's uh it wakes uh, something in you that ties back to your old social or media network that you you did is there anything that you can share with us about that experience or what it was and how how it and and, and maybe what happened with that whole experience because i th it's a very personal journey but it's also i think and you tell me if i'm wrong it played a lot into the game that you just launched it played a lot into pretty much anything that you do in the digital environment because you're always trying to What's the future of that space? How can I create something? This is something that I that we're talking about or working on for a while. How do we make these new things emerge and, and, and think about those futures? Yeah, I mean, for, for us, I think it was a wild time. We were back in Berlin. Um, we were studying at the University of Arts uh, Communication and I had um, strategy, innovation and um, movie making as my main subjects. And this kind of like, originally always wanted to be a movie director. This was a big dream, you know, I wanted to be a movie director, I wanted to create like stories, you know, I wanted to like tell stories and I was obsessed with movies. My, my mom um, was uh, like working in the video club when I was like three years old. And so I was just a lot of time around with videotapes. I saw so many stuff, my my kindergarten teacher, my mom had to come into kindergarten and they said I was pushing people to play with me Battlestar Galactica and Star Wars. So I was really like totally obsessed with science fiction and kind of this like doing a startup was making a couple of those dreams come true in once, you know, it's just creating even a universe, you know, it's just like, um, yeah, it was super, super exciting. And the first treatment for the app I was I was writing. So um, uh, Gabriel Joran, my, my co-founder, he had actually the technology idea. He come up with this, oh, let's turn the Bluetooth on and you can see other people. Later on, we did it then with GPS and iPhone and whatever, but that was the basement of like, wow, what it would be when you could see the interests of the people nearby, when you could have like a matchmaking nearby system. And that was a dream, you know, the dream was that, um, I mean, we all love Poudrier movies. Uh, I, I'm a big Tom Waits fan. I love to play table football. And I was always thinking, you know, you knew in the city where you find that people, you know, it's just, uh, this was a dream. And then in the end, what happened that, um, yeah, a lot of gay people met in the parks for our app, I would say. That was just happening. It was also cool. But um, it was just, uh, um, we were starting with something and then people used it for something. And it was just um, a ride, you know, because in this moment when we kicked it off, the, the iPhone was not there. And so it was a bro broken ecosystem. So you try to explain people what is an application, a software application, and how you download it, and how you can find the app then afterwards again, and all this stuff. And then the iPhone was coming out. And 
everything changed and it was a super exciting time traveling around the world, pitching the app, um, meeting fascinating people. And then it happened that um, we presented the app in the Mobile Peer Awards, I think it was in 2009. And this was actually my last happy moment for this story because um, afterwards uh, someone was come approached me and said, wow, this is a fantastic idea what you have presented there. And um, it was someone from um, Apple and they were featuring us at the next day. And we were not prepared for that. <laughs> absolutely not prepared for it. and it was really wow wow servers on fire and we were basically yeah we could not grow anymore because every day at actually i think around six seven o'clock it was making boom you know and the app was down and it was a classical total failure basically in the technology perspective we had a lot of users but made them absolutely upset and um, it, yeah, it's meant, it was a different time, you know, StudiVZ, uh, Twitter, uh, all the people built on Ruby on Rails had problems. I mean, the, yeah, the communication over mobile phone, it was just much more hotter than the classical servers and crazy times. So yeah, I stopped sleeping well. Um, we tried to, um, yeah, rebuild everything. So we, we were rewriting the whole backend and I, um, we brought Gabriel in from Barcelona, from uh, London in this time, but it was a bit too late, you know? We were really, um, it's just you have this moment and when that not everything falls into place, you don't have so many second and third chances, especially when you're from a German startup, you know? We were not funded by Silicon Valley where they say, here, here, another 20 million, let's go, you know? We, we had good, very good funding, um, but we, um, we were not in the same environment than our competition, you know, that was sad. That was really sad. When I think the same thing in the US with the same traction, we would have another chance to turn it around, you know, and we were not experienced enough. We were kids, you know, it was the first uh, startup. And um, for me, I learned a lot because on the way, we achieved so much. I mean, we were winning so many awards. I mean, we were in French television. We were uh, really all over the place at this time. I mean, people were knowing me on the street. It was weird. And gives you this feeling of you are like superwoman. You know, you are like, I imagine it. I want it. I work hard for it. It will happen. Until a specific moment where it not, it's not working anymore. And you run against a wall and you're like, Oops, who am I, by the way? <laughs> and that That's was quite uh, the experience. Yeah, it was an amazing experience. Yeah, and uh, it uh, was interesting. I felt a felt a little bit like Phoenix, you know, because I um, I was crushed when it was over, you know, and um, uh, so I had to really, yeah, redesign myself. And uh, I was so basically Gabriel um, then decided also after now I was basically not an Aka Aki anymore, I was not a CEO anymore. And then he decided I become now his girlfriend. He really was very, <laughs> very eager about, I will not be his a girlfriend so long, I'm his boss's face. <laughs> Don't say it's Spanish person. I know he's very lovely, but he was really uh, like the hero in the story. So he said, Stephanie, you have to go away two, three months and you have to yeah, make some digging. And I really was sitting down with a notebook and uh, a book was very funny book, how to be happy in 100 steps or something like that with millions of questions. And I was just two months sitting down every day answering those questions. I, so, I yeah, think not only is it probably a discovery period, but you, you had ex immense learning that has now shaped your life for many other things. I mean, just by talking about Clubhouse, a different app, you know, you can see how, how influential that time is. The, the beautiful thing to see is that your your husband was kind of in, in the backgrounds all along and kind of there's this thing. And, and, and before we go too much more into the other questions, I kind of want to ask, how how is it constantly working uh, uh, with the person that you love? How is that? You know, we both have friends, Tim Lieberich, the business romantic and 
Frederick Laloux, Reinventing Organizations. We talk about this humans of new work, but that's really this uh, business romance, this uh, liking the people you work with and, and doing that. I come from family businesses, so I know how it is to, to work with people that you love in, in, a, in a different way as well. So, I, but I would like to hear it from you. What, what does that do or how does that shape you? I mean, it is challenging, you know, obviously. I mean, the thing is, my husband, when we met each other, and I remember the first compliment um, he, met, he, he really made to me was, when I met you uh, the first time and we talked, I was thinking one day I want to work with you together. And I was uh, feeling extremely appreciated because I really saw that he, um, not only we were best friends, but he was also appreciating a lot my thoughts. And as a woman, that's something extremely fulfilling. When you have someone on your side appreciates your opinion, appreciates your way of thinking, uh, likes to be challenged. Um, yeah, it's just very freeing, you know? It's just, um, and he's also the person I always can be 100% myself. There's nothing I'm ashamed about to say or think or whatever. He just gives me this, 100% support as a human being. And that's, yeah, this is a huge present. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, he is a perfectionist and he is like a hard worker and is tough like hell. You know, he's much tougher than me and he's a much more harder worker than me. And he now, he, he can do this like two years working on that game, you know, and that's, um, don't say, but it's a mind fuck. Really, it can yeah. kill you. Normal, when you're a weak person, you can't go through that. You, you have yeah. to be really strong in your mind um, and always looking for, uh, yeah, and in games, you need perfection. You need, otherwise, it's just not the diamond it has to be, you know? And um, so it's tough to work with him, definitely. Um, and uh, we are very different characters, but um, so I'm always trying to balance this out, you know? So we did also after Aka Aki an app called Gabi and there he drove me crazy. He, he was in San Francisco by presenting the app and, at the Apple conference uh, uh, to, to a couple of Apple people and was very also very successful app, but he was like, basically, I was not sleeping because he was then four o'clock, uh, I was still with him and sleeping two, three hours and he was up again. And he was like, really, I was like, oh my God, you know, we, we really have to find some breaks. And what changed really our life was this uh, spiritual path we have together by going together every year when it was possible to the ashram. Um, he is a very good meditator and we really needed this kind of like, yeah, also common interest, what is balancing out our like professional obsessions, basically. <laughs> so yeah. that's very helpful. And to find that in a relationship is very important and also have periods where you don't work together. I think yeah, after so work-life balance. Yeah. yeah. It sounds so easy, it's so difficult, but just give yourself uh, also moments of uh, yeah to tell that you're able to tell other stories you know and it's it's really important oh so, yeah that's beautiful so i'm so happy I, it's over by the way i'm happy it's over. i bet i bet <laughs> now now it's the time to truly lean back for a while and and, and uh, uh, you know kind of rebalance it i mean uh, I mean, emailed you this past weekend. You're like, oh, I had a digital detox this weekend. I, I do that uh, as well. We, we have an, I think we have another friend that's in common. Um, Julia von Winterfeld. I don't know if you know her, but yeah. Uh, Soul Works and that. And, and her and Gianna do this wonderful or did this wonderful retreat that I spoke at. And it was just a, a beautiful retreat that I, that I did. But it was a total digital detox. And, and then we did the Wim Hof. Uh, we got in the Wim Hof, uh, did the Wim Hof breathing, but we got in the, uh, the creek and it was just beautiful. But that, that detox, that pause, that separation, you just need it to kind of, to, and I, I tell you, it was a savior. I think on that, that year, I'd, I'd done something like 200 and and uh, 11 events by the time I went to that retreat, I spoke there. So it was, it was kind of like a work thing, but I also participated in the retreat. 
but it was saved my hide because right after that it went back in uh right up until uh lockdown time it was nothing but work and events and things and so you just really need that pause to, to rebalance to reset and um to move forward this constant work is just um um Stress is the silent killer, you know, and, and even though you're saying it's just a workhorse and workhorse, eventually it will come back to get you. I, I, I haven't had too many conversations with you uh, in depth or, or, or otherwise until now, so I don't even know where your stance is on sustainability environments, environmental social governance, sustainable development goals, Paris Agreement. Uh, can can you kind of give me just a general overview of what you do, what you touch on those, and what your thoughts and feelings are? That's a very interesting topic for me because um, we were, I man, I cannot talk about the client, but we worked on a um, CO2 topic. Um, and that was really nice because we did a lot of in depth interviews about people and their motivation to really track their CO2 emission and we were, and this also feels extremely good, you know, to work around that topics. And this is the reason I love clients when they come around with stuff like that. And we do like all the extra work for that. And it was really interesting. There was one um, finding was that the people on the one hand, they are willing to pay more for like sustainable products or like bio products and stuff like that. But they constantly feel it's um, especially when they are not have such a high income, that's more for privileged people. And they feel extremely frustrated what they can do. And so we were just really thinking about how is that when you combine basically the message of you can save money and save the planet. And this was a very interesting thought. And I think that marketing wise, um, because I think they were not using it so st strongly in the end, like how we were here and there suggesting it. Um, but I think this could be when anybody is listening out of this field, something, it could be huge. <laughs> it could be huge. And it is totally doable. So um, I was like designing there some stuff and I think that could work so good, you know? And this, um, when I'm by myself, I'm like 90% vegan. I'm here and there doing the cheese, what's very bad. When you look at the footprint from cheese, it's a nightmare. Cheese is a nightmare. But I learned in this whole project a lot. So I, I don't know if you were knowing it, but what do you think is worse? The CO2 footprint of fries, 100 gram fries or 100 gram schnitzel? I would say 100 gram fries. Yeah, it's 100 gram fries by far. It's so it's so crazy because they chemically also um, change the the outside layer of the fries for the frying process, and then of course like it's pre-processed fruit and etc. So it's not the potato. Potato is not a bad one, but the fries and all the processed foods is a nightmare. So and there's this amazing um, in Germany and data. I mean, we have it all somewhere. There are really interesting lists where you can find each object basically with a CO2 footprint and there you will find so many interesting uh, information and that could be also already something that's really interesting to make much more transparent, you know, this could be another game one day. You know? <laughs> so, oh yeah, I mean, there's so many gamification concepts in that arena emerging and tools that just empower people in their daily lives. Um, that 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 kind of turn it in use gamification to make it something enjoyable or a tool that you could use every day as, as a transition because i mean it's it's not i mean there's a transitional period that you need in, in order to 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 not need the game or to the, the tools anymore until you're up to that knowledge and you you're just auto but then some people need that kind of not almost entertaining or fun way or to, to, to get there, to do better, to, to be nudged, to do things and also rewarded for doing positive things. So I, I like that. The, I mean, the reason I kind of want to know, and I knew you, you probably have ran and uh, ran across things in the past uh, in your dangerous is, you know, I do that a lot. And so the, 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 the 
big discussions on, on my um, podcasts are, are really around innovation, around the future, around sustainability and the environment. And what, what most people don't know, and even it's funny because we're both part of Mblove and Future IO and different things like that. And we know Harold, we in, in the Kinternet uh, groups and things. Um, but what most people in, in innovation and futurism don't know is that sustainability is really the cores of it are innovation, the future, and economics that don't, most people don't know. And so when I say I'm a sustainable futurist or when I say I'm a resilient futurist, uh, it, it's not that far off because the core studies or knowledge of those items are always about innovation, always about the future, and always about the economic models that's working or not working for the future. And so, um, you know, I've even had some people say, what's this tree hugger, uke muke guy, Mark, doing with these innovators and these futurists? And I'm surprised sometimes that they haven't put those two together because they go hand in foot. That whole foresight modeling, that whole third dimensions and, and the three horizons and, and anything all has to do with sustainability is, is yeah. And so, um, and that, that brings me, I mean, you, I mean, you could say something about that, but it really brings me to the, the main, the hardest question I have for you today. Um, since we are in these innovative and futurist and creative groups of, of, of forward thinkers is the burning question, WTF, what's the future? Not the swear word, not the thing that we've experienced, but but what's the future for you? What what are, are what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Wow, I mean, it's it's a very tough one. It's a really a really tough one. I mean, when I um, when I see there are in this world more and more people are like vocal who are, and I say now, don't think it only in the spiritual way, but are more awakened than before, you know? And so I, on the, on the positive side, I see more and more people like experience that um, consume is not like fulfilling and will leave most probably a big hole after that, or only the taste for more. And that's not going anywhere. I mean, hard is that as a human, we, a lot of people has first day experiences before they come to that point. Only a few don't need to experience to go to this point, you know? So if people are minimalist, they're millionaires, whereas in okay, that was the easy one. <laughs> so, but um, I, I, I hope uh, that we all come to that point that we see, wow, this is, have a conscience about what is the minimum I need and can have a great life of and where I can share and where I can uh, support others and stop being so greedy, you know. What I love about Corona is that this, uh, we sit all in one boat was never ever so visible for everybody. And it was this like amazing experience for everybody. So whatever happens here, somewhere has an effect on it. And um, also this experience that like, um, here in, in Blanes they never have seen in this lifetime and even the lifetime before uh, dolphins and they saw dolphins on the coast here so it was now obviously that yeah the human impact on earth uh, was also extremely visible in corona time so that makes me hopeful because more and more people saw or got conscience about that so for me yeah we have to find a way to but I don't know, I don't have one solution because the problem is so, it's a, such a complex problem. It needs so many solutions. There is not one for it. And the question is what we all from our side can do for this, you know, or what is the passion part where we in one little part can bring something forward and how we can find platforms where we can collaborate more. Because I feel there are so many initiatives, but they are very, um, yeah, alone a little. And they are very, maybe, okay, the foodies with the foodies and the techies with the techies, but how we can find or create more spaces where the space people, what we did a actually very nice uh, event for Continental, where uh, we brought together space tech people with agriculture tech people. 
And that was so great for all of them. They really said, wow, it's all so connected. We never talk with people from that field. And that goes together again with the Christocratic dialogue or MLOV. It's like, we need more platforms for like inter sexual and you know what I mean sections and not sexual <laughs> intersections and interdisciplinary uh, conversations can happen and um, and of course funds hopefully will also more um, yeah be excited about this kind of projects but it's such a big question my god of course you know? it is no yeah. I, I think oh. you, got the, you got the answer right uh, um, they, I've asked thousands of people literally thousands of people that question and everyone's answers uh, uh, is different and um, everyone is very unique. Um, I really can, I, I think maybe two or three were really groundbreaking where I would say, wow, that's fabulous. There, there are a couple of reasons why I asked. One, I generally want to know and, and believe in, in what you said, but just like when, whether you're designing uh, the, the, the queen rules game or whether you're designing a social app or whether you're starting a business you need to have a plan you need to have goals you need to write a business plan and then try to work that uh, in order to be a su success same thing with the future if you don't know what the plan is or what the future looks like uh, uh, as a futurist or can't even have some predictive models then you're never going to reach that someone else is going to deliver the future for you someone else is going to your, your business is going to fold or someone else is going to do your business for you. And so I think it's really vital that we begin asking ourselves that question. We should have done it decades ago. But then we also currently look around the, the, at the models that our world is currently operating on, whether it's the European uh, uh, New Green Deal or if it's uh, the Paris Agreement or the SDGs. Uh, what's the global plan or what's what's our country plan and what direction are we moving on? And if we push them out into the futures, are they ones that work for all of us and do they go indefinitely? And so that's kind of was my thought process on, on asking you that question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I looked actually into the numbers for Germany quite like intensively for the CO2 project I worked on. And it was already very frustrating because the German goal, I think, is by like a 2000 uh, tons. Um, and that's really only achievable now in Corona. In the moment you enter in an airplane, it's over basically. Um, and you have to be poor. When it's first interesting, we were talking to so many people, the smallest footprints were by people with very low income conscience very low income people so like um, retired people who had very low income and of course they could not buy and they were conscious they were gardening they were eating there and not so many processed food but it was weird you know it was really to see hey um, in Germany the goals we have set are absolutely not achievable it's like uh, it's like people have to start now doing things completely differently and and one thing was also no one wanted to know his score but in man it's like really bad when you think about it everything when you think you can do it about quantified self it's bullshit no one will do anything counting actually his misbehavior there is no nothing no motivation behind it whatever i do it gets worse it's just there's no positive feedback loop happening, you know. Well, there are, there are quite a bit of tools, and there's more emerging every day. And I I I I mean, I don't want to take all all our time together where me where we discuss on what some of the solutions are and what some of the uh, wonderful things that are emerging. I mean, a report just came out <clears throat> uh, this week about from the United Nations, the UNF Triple C about the Paris Agreement and about the SDGs and how we're on, uh, how we're absolutely not on track. And that it didn't, it didn't look very positive. Um, and uh, it, it, from the report stance, but in, in reality, there's a lot of things that we can do. And one, one factor that humanity doesn't get is that there's this exponential function that that many, many of us don't understand, even though we just experienced the COVID, which which grew exponentially, and it was a, a, a prime case of how the exponential function works and how quickly it, it, it works. And so um, I, I, re I really think that's, you know, 
we can get into the very positive things on, on how we can solve these issues and move forward. But I, I, I really wanted to even switch and focus on another aspect. I tell people a lot, you know, what are the top uh, five things that you could do to stop and reverse global warming or to draw down some of the human suffering and the global grand challenges that we have in our world. And uh, for me, it's, I always say it's global food reform. It's uh, number two and three is empowering women and girls. Number four is to rethink re refrigeration. Number five is to, to move to a renewable transition and, and, you know, and, and then I go on and on. But the second and third one really has to do with you. You're an introvert and almost kind of a, a little bit shy in that respect, but I see you as someone who is not only an empowered woman and a great example to other women, but also that you do very well, not only just the queen's rules type of a game, which is very, very uh, uh, beautiful in and of itself, but that you you kind of tend to gravitate in your circles with other powerful women and, and also finding women that maybe need that empowerment or that example on how to run a business, how to do a startup, how to do programming and be creative and think about the future and do those things. And I, I truly believe that empowering women and girls more than 70% than your CO2 footprint calculations can draw down human suffering and our, and our greenhouse gas emissions are global warming uh, in the fact and many facts. And some people are like, what? How is empowering women and girls going to solve our problems? It is. And I just want to know, I mean, how do you do that? How, how do you deal with that? What do you say? And what kind of are your thoughts and feelings about that? Well, um, interesting, we are very aligned. So my number one is that I'm super into the vegan food movement and also um, sustainable food movement. So I'm actually in the moment thinking we, we just were buying the URL VV network for vegan and vegetarian network. And we, uh -huh. the, the, the sub claim is in the moment like about, um, yeah, conscious food for all. We were just uh, brainstorming around that. So it's just really one of my hot passion topics, you know, so how advocate people and also using community around this topic. Also Nicholas Rupp was also a fellow MLOF. We are like aligned on that. And we, we just started the thinking process around that. So it's just whatever I can do there. And um, also in my close environment, but also um, I try to use my voice. They're also on Clubhouse. I'm in a lot of vegan uh, uh, stuff going on. I'm there. Um, so I believe we really need to look into food and we all could reduce massively all, already by changing our choices by tomorrow. And it's really the impact is crazy, you know, so I think that's really, really, really one of my, my one of my favorite topics, actually. And the second one is the female empowerment. So I'm working with a lot of female leaders and um, I'm I always say it's a little bit like the Robin Hood methodology so taking the money from the one and give it to the others and so I'm also dealing with this with my time so when I have when anybody who's listening as a female CEO or female entrepreneur want to start something or has a problem in his career or feels yeah uncomfortable with something just reach out to me I'm I'm super open um, for having a giving support giving uh, mentoring time and so I'm just mentoring a couple of female entrepreneurs, also a lot of my friends. So I try also to have this kind of like, yeah, support group of, uh, yeah, when you just need also, yeah, someone you can just talk to who has gone through the shit already, you know? So I think that's very important. And I do this also for male and not only for female, but I I'm, uh, try to encourage every female I met to <laughs> reach out to me, I wanna help. <laughs> And um, yeah, so I, um, I see that the, the diversity is the power and we need more um, female people in creating digital world. It's just a too masculine world. Technology is 
just too one-sided. And when I started Aka Aki, it was interesting. The designer made a black website. It was looking like for skaters, you know? And then I said, okay, what do you think who will sign up for this website? Men, you know? And then we made it green and pink and it was for everybody, you know? And it was, was just this like, hey, um, hundreds of men will approach you. We have to be aware of that. We have to protect the females in the service because they will be like, run over and all the sensibility for both parts you know and we really need uh, like a, like a diversity in all the senses we need people who are um, actually don't want to be she or he we need um, kids helping making kids products you know it's just there's so much to do in the diversity section and I see that with how much care females are running businesses and uh, running countries and having empathy so for me, that's then my third big topic is the, to empower the empathy in the business world. And then this is what also, of course, our friend of the business romantic, I think, uh, is leading always to. But for me, um, empathy is also a way of collecting very important information. And you need that information to make better choices. When you have not trained empathy, you really lack of information, you will make bad choices. So it's really a business thing and it's, um, it can be trained and um, it's highly, 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 highly for me important. So this is the top three, three I think it's for me. That's the great. Vegan food, the female leadership and the, the empathy. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, the last three questions I have for you are actually for my listeners. There's something to help them in their lives to empower them. Um, the first one is if there was one message you could depart to my listeners that had uh, a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Take a frequent break for yourself in these times. Every hour, stand up, do something positive for you when it's only five minutes. Um, be conscious with yourself because then you can be conscious to others. This is like, I think it's for me the most important thing. It's just really right. think about your, the airplane thing, you know, the gas mask is coming down, put your, to put your ones on before you help the others. And it's, uh, I see a lot of people burning out in the moment because they don't do it. They, they go over the edge and they think tomorrow they can recover, but one day they can't. And this is the, the rituals to establish new rituals like making yourself a tea in the morning, here and there, stand up, make a nice walk, give yourself a break. What should young innovators in your <laughs> field or young creatives be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a real impact? Don't look only on the best practice cases and try to be like them it's like finding your own identity i think what we with queen rules what we really wanted to achieve is like like looking for something fresh you know for the eyes when the game industry very difficult everyone looks the same everyone is copying each other it's like have, being bold enough to just go for it i mean this is the reason for example i love billy eilish you know i think she's, yeah, awesome. she's just just yeah, be this unique, wonderful self you are, you know, just don't. She's pretend. very sustainable too. I mean, she does a lot of adv advocacy around the environment too. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Uh, the last thing is really, what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? I think really just leaning in, lean back, like reaching out for help earlier, you know, as it's like I tried with all the force to do it and not to create also an environment that everyone can do it together, you know, it's just, it's very egomanic when you think you can do it alone and you, um, yeah, very, <laughs> I would love to go back and shake myself and say, you can't do shit alone. <laughs> How you can now think about to make everybody all the time co-responsible and do it together. Yeah, I think this. I love it. I love it. 
Stephanie, it has been absolutely fabulous. Thank you for your time. I'm so glad that you took the time to visit with me and have this discussion. And that's all I have for you, unless there's something you didn't get to say that you wanted to say, now's your chance. But otherwise, I think I'll say goodbye. Thank you so much. No, it was, I enjoyed it a lot. We should do this in another space for another reason one day. Again, I would love to continue talking to you. It was a big pleasure. And I thank Harold here on this place for uh, yeah, bringing us together and um, yeah, running this like amazing initiatives that um, yeah, we have chances to meet people out of our space and maybe in the same space we were not even knowing about each other. Exactly. Thank you so much. And you have a wonderful day and tell Gabrielle hello from me and, and uh, you guys have a wonderful day there in Spain. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks, bye, -bye. bye.